All right, if you can move the camera on yeah. to me first. There is no PowerPoint that I'm going to show on this one. It's we're only going to be a Houston's PowerPoint here. Hey, guys, everyone who's online, everyone who made it here, thank you so much. Uh, this is a Meet and Shoot member event. You guys, a few of you guys have been a few before. Some of you guys are new. Um, we love these, and this one's a uh, this one's a really unique one because it's a uh, the first guest speaker we've had for 2015. We had one for 2013, and I don't think we did any guest speakers last year. Uh, but something we were highly are more intrigued with doing this year is getting guest speakers out uh, in person, and, and then also doing education ones online. And so the guest speaker tonight is Houston Smith. Smith, right? Smith. Um, yeah. Jordan, oh my goodness! <laughs> also, so, thank you. Uh, before uh, before we go into uh, what he, you know what his discussions or you know what he's going to talk about, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, meet and shoot real quick, um, guys. Uh, this is a member event. Uh, new hands. Anyone here within like you know started became a member within a week or anything like that? Any, anyone here? All right. A lot of you guys have been here before. You guys know what know what this is. Um, the meet and shoot member events are educational events or shoots or so on that are set up for our members. Essentially, it's like having a Costco membership. Your meet and shoot member, you get to go into the into the event, and enjoy the enjoy the place, get the samples, you know. Uh, but if you want to buy something like other shoots, you still have to pay for it, but they are discounted really nicely. Uh, as such, you know, we're not going to talk too much about meet and shoot, but something that we're looking forward to is there's a lot more events coming up. Uh, there's already, I believe, like eleven events that are up there now that you can uh, register for only like four of them because the rest are sold out. But there's a lot more that we have coming up. Uh, if it says member events, as long as you are a paid member, um, you can come. The thing is, um, if you owe your uh, if you owe your membership dues, guys, pay it. Uh, we should have a better system at keeping track of like who's members or not. But in the all honest truth, Chris and I and all the rest of the crew do this because we love, you know, photography. And when you guys join as a member, we're just using that to help build what we can do further. Um, in the sense of meet and shoot for events and so on for you guys and so on. And so if anyone, um, if anyone thinks that they're towards the end of their membership, uh, feel free to go ahead and renew. You know, uh, if, you're, if you still got a lot of time left, don't worry about it. But if you're 15 months into it, you're not gonna get a little note on your door that says you need to renew your meet and shoot membership. It is really based on the honor system. Uh, but what we, try to, what we try to showcase to people is month after month, time after time, we are doing this, we love doing this. And we love contributing positively to the photography community in Atlanta. Uh, so as such, I'm trying to think of anything else that needs to be mentioned. Oh, uh, shoots coming up. We have, uh, we have a lot of spotlight sessions coming up. Unfortunately, a lot of them are sold out. The one that I really want to go ahead and mention, and I mentioned it to a few of, people, a few of the people in here before, March 22nd is a Stanley Kubrick-inspired masquerade shoot at the Tabernacle in Georgia. It's a great event. Uh, it's going to be absolutely outstanding with a lot of models who are going to dress in um, masquerade masks, tuxedos, formal dresses with a beautiful location. I don't know if you guys, a majority of you guys have been to the Tabernacle. So it's not necessarily the stage that we're going to be like, oh, shoot, at the stage, though we are probably going to do an inspired one where we have a spotlight, but everywhere in the venue, you know, the stairwell, the rooms and stuff like that. A uh, great location that you guys can go, you know, go to and use so that's a plan there for that one a couple of the other ones we have another event hosted at uh houston smith's place let me make sure i think i hit hmm? i think uh well it's may 23rd i believe yeah. right it's sure. may 23rd and i believe there is 10 slots left um something we are exploring this year i'm glad you mentioned that guys is we are capping yeah. out our uh capping out our shoots and so people have the optimum time to work with the models and so forth. I think last night was pretty successful in the sense that we capped it out at 40. That's the first time where, and it sold out. And it sold out fairly uh, fairly quick, I mean, uh, in comparison. But uh, so guys, I hate to say it, but if you want to go to a shoot and you love it, you know, sign up for it. The other thing is, though, we understand that this is a luxury. So you're going to hear this from me. If you don't have the money now, feel free to talk to us and say, hey, Trent, I know I want to go there. Can you reserve me a spot? Talk to Chris too. We don't want, you know, we don't, we're not thinking money. We're thinking opportunities for people. And if it's somewhere you really want to be, guys, we've been here for a while. Just talk to us, you know, and we'll uh, we'll make it work out. So as such, if you don't mind moving that, we're gonna turn the presentation over. The only thing I'm going to say lastly before you do is uh, 
PowerPoint presentation, but we have web on here. So if anyone online doesn't see um, doesn't see a slide in full clarity, that information will be sent later. Um, that's it. Thank you, Trent. So this is my first meet and shoot event. So I'm a noob. Thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Houston Smith. I'm an attorney here in town. Um, about me. I'm born and raised in Atlanta, so I'm kind of a, an odd bird. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, can we turn that down? Yeah, let me see. If I okay. Um, since Trent mentioned the shoot on May 23rd at my house, I know some of you have been there, some of you haven't. Um, at the boudoir shoot most recently, the girls were willing to go outside, but it was really, really cold. So it'll be warmer in May. And on top of that, I say I've got a, a, a backyard and also a sunken terrace very conducive to implied or whatever you want to do down there and there are mosquito systems that do that mosquito misting stuff so you don't have to worry about getting killed by bugs also makes the models happy you know they're not going to be killed by bugs when they're wearing you know two pieces of cotton or whatever <laughs> suffice these days all right so as a lawyer i've been practicing since 1991. i went went to duke undergrad and then university of georgia law school after that um, i spent 10 years working for insurance companies what's called insurance defense and as John knows that's where you work for the insurance company if somebody or if you're insured causes harm to somebody else and they get sued then the insurance company would hire somebody like me to defend the insured and that meant we got to come up with all sorts of creative ways to say that people were not at fault it also meant we got to come up, we got to hear lots of creative ways plaintiff's attorney said somebody is at fault after 10 years of doing that we decided to switch over now all we do is help out people who have been hurt so I've seen both sides of claims for negligence claims, property damage claims, um, getting injured on somebody's property, slip and falls. Uh, I think I had a couple defamation cases, sexual harassment cases, med mal. Um, a lot of people out there want to make claims. And so when I was putting together this talk for tonight, I started thinking about what would I like to know I could possibly get in trouble with if I didn't know the laws in relation to being a photographer, working with models, having them. Thank you having them in my home, etc. So the talk tonight is going to focus a little bit on insurance law that I think everybody should know just because there's too much misinformation out there. And then I'm going to get into photography specific stuff. If anybody has any questions, please just raise your hand. I find it's better to do questions while we're going rather than at the end. Because at the end, you may have forgotten what the question was. So I don't mind stopping at all. Yes, ma'am. If I have a client that they are divorced and one of the pair brings the child to photograph, and just sign. Is that legal or should both of them if they have? I, I would think it would be. If they have. Don't want it and don't, you know. I don't do any family law, so I'll preface by saying that. <laughs> you, you're going to hear a lot of, I don't do that area of law, but <laughs> I want to be very clear about when I feel I'm an expert and when I'm not. I would think if you had a custodial parent sign, that would be okay. Um, now, how are you going to know they're a custodial parent unless they bring all the paperwork to you? So, no, I know okay, <laughs> then I think you'd be okay. All right. All right. So first thing I want to talk about is insurance. We're going to touch on auto insurance, home and renter insurance, and a little bit about camera insurance. First part about auto insurance, uh, back up. So that's my law firm, and that's what we do. Plans personal injury insurance contract since 1991. Now insurance, auto, home, and camera. Let's talk about auto first. No, that's not my car. Um, Auto insurance, this is my little public service announcement because I hear way too many times that people don't have the kind of auto insurance they need to have. Who here has full coverage? What they've been told is full coverage. Okay. I've, I've heard that so many times I just want to throw up. Full coverage, well, there is no legal definition of full coverage. What I think people mean by that is you are fully covered within what the law says you must have, which ain't much. Um, full coverage means that you have the minimum allowed required by Georgia law. So you've got twenty-five thousand for property. I'm sorry for liability. Fifty thousand for a, a whole accident, and probably ten thousand for property damage. That's not nearly enough. We we like to have like our clients to have a minimum of a hundred thousand dollars for uh, bodily injury liability. Does anybody know what their limits are? Yeah. yeah, you, yeah I'm a, uh, okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good. Um, for medical payments coverage, also called MedPay, uh, I'd like to have people with a minimum of $5,000. A 
A lot of, I see a lot of people that don't have MedPay at all or they have $1,000. The reason MedPay is important is the MedPay covers medical bills for you and for anybody in your car if they get hurt, no matter whose fault the accident is. And that money is also available to pay immediately rather than going through a long claims process. So that's important to have. You can go to the hospital and walk out that same night with a $2,000 bill. So 5,000 is not a whole lot. UM coverage. Who here thinks they know what UM is other than? Right, okay. This to me is the most important coverage you can have because this is the insurance that you get that can pay you if you get hurt. So you're driving along and somebody runs the red light and smashes in the side of you and turns out they have no coverage or they have full coverage of 25,000. And you've got $50,000 in medical bills, you've been out of work for three months, you don't have disability coverage, and your claim is worth a whole lot more than $25,000. You want to have as much UM coverage for yourself as you can afford. Again, we recommend $100,000 as a minimum. Um, if you can afford more, get more. You cannot buy more UM than you have liability. Other thing about UM is there are two flavors of it. Uh, this is new from a couple years ago. One of them is called add-on, and the other one is called reduced by. Add-on means that your UM coverage adds on to the limit of somebody else's liability coverage. So you have 100 UM, they have 25, you now have 125 insurance you can get to. The other kind is called reduced by. It means reduced by the amount of the other guy's coverage. So you're paying for 100, but they've got 25, so you can only get to 75 of the 100 you're paying for. You don't want that kind, you want to add on. <coughs> okay, homeowner's insurance covers, a lot of people don't know this, they cover if somebody sues you, not because of a car wreck, but you did something outside of your car they say was negligent and they want to get money out of you. So your homeowner's insurance has negligence money for you, liability money. They also, you can have med pay coverage for your home as well. Renters does the same thing. You can get camera equipment covered on your renters, I believe, I haven't had it before. I know you can get it on your homeowners if you get a rider. And you can also get camera equipment covered under the professional associations Yes, Sheldon. How, how would you alter your approach to that if you're doing large gate business? I think you'd have to have professional coverage, and I believe the standard is if you make more than 50% of your income from photography, then that makes you a professional rather than an amateur. Um, I would talk with the insurance agent or the people at the the, the companies. Yes. I, I try to arrange to contact the homeowners association for uh, not homeowners association, but home, uh, homeowners. Uh, right, the coverage company. Yeah. And essentially, in that contract, they, they, I said, look, I just want to find details. You're giving me these, these, you know, baseline numbers, and I want to see the fine print, you know, what, what's covered, what's not covered, disclaimers, all the fine print. They wouldn't give it. Is there any reason why that is not standard? standard? No, that's definitely not standard. Yeah, um, I would send a certified letter to your agent or to the company if you don't have an agent and request a a uh, full and complete copy. The have agent told me, you know, hey, if you don't like it, just go away, you know. And then I called the, 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 the parent company. They said, oh, we've got to investigate it, and they called me back. I think I might switch insurance companies. <laughs> <laughs> just to be practical about it. I'm not certain about that. I have a rider because they wanted to know all the serial numbers and take pictures and purchase price and then initial the receipts, which I didn't have. I know you're covered if you have a rider. I think you're covered up to a certain amount if you don't have a rider, but with camera bodies being three grand, five grand, good lenses being two plus, I bet a lot of people here have 10 grand plus in camera equipment, if not more. Also, it, you have other things like firearms. It, exactly. Yep. Absolutely. Um, last thing I want to mention on here is umbrella coverage. So I talked about the liability coverage on your car should be at least 100. So that's the money that the insurance company will write to somebody else if you screw up and hurt them. Well, what if you want more? Then you get an umbrella, or you get as much as the auto company will give you or sell to you, but then you still want more, so you get an umbrella. An umbrella coverage, um, you can, I've seen them at five million, one and two million are, are common. That provides additional coverage for you on top of your auto coverage and also on top of your homeowner's coverage if you're negligent. Um, if you get an umbrella, also I would suggest getting an umbrella with UM coverage as well. Most companies will not sell a UM umbrella. The only one I know that does now is State Farm. Not an ad for State Farm, but if you want one, that's where you go. Yes? 
I'm sorry? Why are umbrella policies seem to be so much cheaper than regular insurance? Um, because you'd have to screw up really badly to get into them, and so they don't get used much. But major. Yeah, they're, yeah. Okay, switching gears here. Yeah, no, I think I pay, I've got a two million and pay either, either 400 or 700 or something in, in that neighborhood per year, which I think is a fantastic deal for coverage. I mean, if you ever need it, you really need it. I think I forgot to say that about insurance. I have written down, it always costs too much until you need it, then you wish you had more. I don't like buying a stock that goes way up, you never buy enough of those. I had a case once where an insurance agent sold a policy to a lady with a million dollar liability policy and 25,000 UM. And wouldn't you know it, she got in a bad wreck with somebody, $100,000 in bills, et cetera, and the other guy had 25 grand, she had 25 grand of the reduced type, so she had zero UM coverage. Um, agents will not push UM coverage. My theory is that insurance companies, it's also not very expensive, so they don't really want you to have it. Personal theory, but it seems to be borne out by the facts. Okay, back to working with models. Uh, whenever lawyers are involved, and it, <laughs> there's you know, questions of, well, you know, can, I, can I get sued, or what could happen to me, or is this gonna work? Um, two phrases that come up with maddening regularity are one, anybody can sue anybody for anything. So the question of, can I get sued? Yes, you can get sued. Second, <laughs> second phrase that is related says, well, will they win? And the phrase that comes in is, it depends. The answer of it depends comes up way too much. I'm just telling you that now. Okay, uh, safety for models, and these are you know, from the st these are all common sense from a legal standpoint. Um, chaperones. I, it seems to be a heated debate among photographers whether chaperones are good, bad, terrible, or wonderful. Um, who, who loves chaperones? There, the model says, "I want to bring a chaperone." Who absolutely says, "I don't want to work here if you're bringing a chaperone?" And there's a lot in between. Some of the models think if you want to allow a chaperone, you're a shady guy and you're trying to you know, do something guy with camera ish that they don't want to talk about. And from the photographer side of things, there's a significant other chaperone who's had one of those where he just kind of ruined the vibe of the shoot. Yeah. Um, from the standpoint of model safety, I saw one model post this once. She says, I don't bring a chaperone. I figure if you're a crazy killer, you're going to kill a chaperone and kill me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thought of it that way, but yeah, that's probably true. Um, as I said, we lawyers think about what could possibly go wrong and try to work backwards from that. So pretend you have a shoot and there's a chaperone there who is a friend of the model. And then for whatever reason, the shoot kind of goes south and everybody's very happy with it. And later on, the model decides, hey, you know, let's cook up a story that this photographer was inappropriate and touching me and, you know, just, you know, was way out of bounds. You know, the chaperone friend is probably going to go along with it against one at that point. That votes against chaperones from the photographer's point of view for trying to be safe and not get sued for things. My response to that is drop cams. I have drop cams in my house, I shoot in my house. Um, that way the camera records what's going on. So everybody is held to the standard of what they could see. The other way I get around with people who want chaperones is I will invite a, model, a makeup artist who is also a model or has modeled and that way they can stay on the shoot, they can stay there for touch-ups, whatever you want to say, and that way you've got somebody who's in the shoot, who's there seeing what's going on, and is more likely to be objective or decided with you if the model tries to say something, but the model still has somebody there. So those are my thoughts on chaperones. Um, next one is hazards. Anybody who's been to my house, and several of you have, know that at some point I'll say, if you see a gun, it's loaded, and if you see a blade, it's very sharp. Um, that's because those are hazards that are known to me. They're not necessarily known to other people. The duty of a landowner or an occupier of land is if they have superior knowledge of a defect or a danger, they must tell the people on the premises. So for example, if I have a big pit in the middle of my room, just a big open hole, um, I don't have to have a sign that says big open hole because it's obvious to everybody. It's dangerous, but it's obvious. You cover it with a rug, you say, don't step there. There's a big hole that's covered up. A lot of people think if you're at somebody's home and you get hurt, you're automatically, the homeowner is automatically at fault, and that's just not true. Your duty is to warn or to fix the defect if you know about it. Um, yeah. 
Um, it, it could be written. You just have to have the, the warning there. Um, now, I guess you get questions of what if somebody can't read or they don't read that language or I don't know. I guess it's a safe thing to do if you're, if you're having people in your home and you know of a rickety step or a handrail that's loose, either fix it or tell them about it. So what happens if you've got a model at your house and she's walking along on high heels and for whatever reason she trips over her feet and goes tumbling down the stairs and you know breaks an arm and gash in her face? Are you at fault? On that example, no, you're not. You didn't do anything to make her trip. But if you have a rug at the top of the stairs that you know is kind of slick and moves around and you haven't put one of those little mats under it or secured it down and you haven't told the girl, watch out, that rug up there is loose and she trips because of the rug, then you can be at fault. It can be little dangers too. Um, there's a business not too far from here. Anybody know Sushi Nami down this? Okay. Um, a couple years ago, there was a lady who was walking into Sushi Nami from the parking lot. She walked in just fine, but what she didn't notice was that the sidewalk there, she's walking this direction, sidewalk here, and then the next piece of sidewalk is here, and it's about an inch and a half sunken down. You may remember that. Uh, they did some repair work there at one point. What happened was there'd been a, a water leak from inside. It had washed out some of the earth underneath one of the sidewalk pads, so it sunk down. She walked in from the high side to the low side, didn't even notice it. As she's leaving, as I'm telling the story, you know something bad happened to her. As she's leaving, her foot, her tip of her foot, caught that one and a half inch lip and dropped her real hard down on both knees. She wound up needing bilateral knee replacements. And just to say this, the case resolved in a confidential manner the day before trial. Uh, in my mind, the reason that Sushinami was at fault was they knew about this problem. They knew about the water leak, they knew the, that the sidewalk had shifted, and they'd also had a lady prior to my client who fell down, didn't have nearly as bad injuries, but fell down and reported it. So they knew about a danger, they failed to fix it, they failed to warn. That's why they were at fault. So if you have anything in your house like that, um, fix it or warn them. Um, I have a little cat, Stewie. Go ahead. some of the rigging and then the rigging was crappy. I am not completely sure on that. If the, it, it depends. Uh, if the rig failed because the equipment was bad, then that wasn't the photographer's or the rigger's fault. If the rig failed because the rigger was negligent and didn't know what he or she was doing or just did it wrong, I would assume that the performance artist would have a claim for garden variety negligence against the rigor. That said, I think most of these artists tend to check the rigor. So I hope that doesn't happen. Um, oh, Stewie, my cat. Uh, I've seen Stewie. Stewie's a very sweet cat to me. Stewie also swaps people. So I tell people, I have a cat. His name is Stewie. You're welcome to pet as much as you can, as you'd like to try. And he swats. <laughs> and I, I'd say 75% of the models who have been there have a Stewie story. The first time I knew about Stewie being aggressive with models was the first shoot I had at the house. I was upstairs and the girls were down in the pool table room getting changed. I said, I hear this. Ah! What the heck is that? Turns out Stewie had been in the room all excited, little tail up in the air. And as one of the girls was walking past the pool table, he jumped up on the pool table, walked past her and then pop, swatted her as she walked past. So now I tell people about Stewie. Um, you're going to get a little scratch if he gets you. That's about it. If you have a dog, I would suggest keeping the dog outside. The thing of, well, my dog is dangerous, not a vicious bone in my dog's body. I know a girl who does a lot of dog bite cases, and she says most of the dog bite cases are from the family dog that's not vicious, has never bitten anybody before. If Stewie were the size of a mountain lion, I'd keep him outside too. Okay, what about drinking on shoots? The lawyer in me says, don't do it. Don't drink yourself, don't give anybody else alcohol. You don't want to have that possibly come up in any way, shape, or form. But the photographer says, well, better shot sometimes. When the model says, can I have a glass of wine? <laughs> um, sure, which one would you like? Um, make sure that whoever you're serving is 21, of course. Um, the, the downside of, of alcohol is that 
later on and say he tried to get me drunk, tried to take advantage of me. You know, and then, the, then me, the lawyer for them, says, well, did you serve alcohol to my client? Well, yes. Well, how much did you serve? Well, I just served one glass. Sure you did. Um, once you start serving, it's easy to have the people believe that you serve more than you did. So with that in mind, if you're going to serve bottles, keep control of the bottle. Don't give them a, a bottle of Jack Daniels say, you know, have at it, sway all you want. Keep portion control down and make sure that you're not releasing somebody out into the public who's drunk. And that gets to the dram shop law. Dram shop law says in a nutshell, if someone chooses to drink and then drive and then hurts or kills someone, the at-fault person is not the one who provided the alcohol, it was the person who chose to drink and then drive and then hurt or killed someone. So generally, it's you can't sue whoever served the alcohol. But if you serve alcohol to somebody who is noticeably impaired, knowing that they're going to go drink and drive, then you can be uh, you can get sued. My firm has a $40 million verdict against some bar that's no longer in existence in Cobb County because they overserved somebody and we were able to prove that they knew or should have known that he was going out to drive. That remains uncollected to this day. Uh, next question that comes up a lot is when to sign the model release. And again, I'm looking at this from the standpoint of what if you have a shoot where things go bad and the model wants to come back later and say that you did bad things. Um, is it better to sign before the shoot or after the shoot? Who likes before the shoot? Okay. So like that. Model yeah, model release. Yeah. Um, my opinion, and I haven't seen this, you know, this isn't law any place, I think you're better off after the shoot and for a couple of reasons. The reason I can see before the shoot is it's good just to go ahead and get out of the way. Let's do the paperwork and we can go have the fun shoot. We don't have to do a lot of paperwork at the end of the shoot. I get that. But that leaves open the possibility that somebody can go back later on and say, well, yeah, I signed it then, but then there were these three big photographers there and they were all on top crouching on me and they made me do poses I didn't want to do or having, it's a fetish shoot and there's some rope or bondage or stuff involved. And it just got way out of hand, but I'd already signed it, but I didn't really consent to going through everything I went through. And I guess if I had that client for myself, I would argue, well, if you signed the contract before the shoot and you hadn't really gone through, you couldn't really have consented what happened before it happened. I know these are like things that probably never happened to anybody, but they could. So if they sign the, the release at the end of the shoot, then that's pretty good indication, pretty good evidence that everything went okay. Because if you try to molest somebody and they stick around and sign a piece of paperwork later on, giving you the rights to the pictures, you know, maybe their claim of what you did to them isn't all that valid. Also, uh, practice pointer, I guess, take a picture of the model signing the release, take a picture of the model's ID, Take a picture of the model holding her ID and smiling. Do this all at the end of the shoot. That way, if anybody ever challenges you, then you have photographic evidence with your exit data for time and your file numbers that show that all that occurred at the end of the shoot, not at the beginning. Thank you, sir. Yes. one request. Uh, if anyone asks a question, can repeat it. Okay. Uh, for our online. Be glad to. Thank you. Um, <laughs> one, more, one more question for you. Yes. Um, regarding uh, the drop camps. Uh, if you have those in your house, um, are you then liable, um, yeah, responsible for telling people that enter and force you that uh, those cams are positioned around your house? Mine are where they can be seen. I'm not, I don't believe that I have any responsibility to tell people. Mm -hmm. It's my private property. Right. Um, if you're on public property, then you, you people are taking your picture all the time and they may not tell you. Okay. If somebody comes into your home, it's my opinion you're not required to. Um, don't have any case law to back that one up, though. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sometimes I'll see people, I'll, I can look at them and they go, and they're like, yep, that's the camera. And um, they did find the model, but she didn't write the address. She refused to write her address. Okay. And I could not force her because she's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to put all my information yeah. there. Just I, I think people do that for privacy reasons. Yeah. Um, I, I would explain to them that it, it's you're going to keep the release. The question was, if a model doesn't want to sign, they'll sign the release, but they won't give further information. They won't give address or phone number or whatever. Um, I would explain to them that it's important for you as the photographer to be able to have contact information on them, that you will keep that information private. Um, 
if you have, uh, and if the release is such that you wind up selling or, or somebody else, a publisher gets a hold of the picture, they're going to need to be able to get in touch with the model. You don't want to be the go-between person. So I would think it would be important to get as much as you can. And that, again, gets into taking pictures of the release of the ID as well. But you're right. You can't put a gun to somebody's head and make them yeah. cough up an address. Yeah. But in the future, if I want to put that picture on my website and that person come and say, I just signed. It wasn't complete. Right, the question is, is signing a document for a release but not putting the address down, does that make the signature invalid or somehow? No, I don't believe so. I mean, we, when you sign your credit cards at the Publix, you, that's a contract, but you're not putting your address down. Um, so, I, no, that doesn't, I don't believe that would invalidate at all. Um, I started thinking about you know, the nightmare client that would come to me or the nightmare for somebody else. Some young girl who's 18 decides she wants to do her first photo shoot comes to you, does a shoot, wants to do implied or nudes or whatever, and then a couple years later, um, maybe she's a teacher somewhere, and some probably father is looking at the teacher going, I think I've seen that girl on Tumblr. <laughs> and then it gets out that she had done nude shots before, and then the school decides to fire her because she doesn't fit within the moral clause or whatever the school, you know, Holy Innocent School has. And then she comes to you and says, I got fired because some photographer took advantage of me and you know, did you sign anything? I don't remember. If you have the release sign at the end and you got a you know, the smiling girl at the end and you send, you send that in a package to me, I'm gonna look at it and go, yeah, I'm sorry. This is just a case of you made a bad decision that you're regretting now. There's nothing to do. I can't think of any way to prove the photographer was in the wrong. But if you've got no release, the release was signed at the very beginning and the girl says there was coercion and lots of people that made her do things, you, you may be in trouble. So those are my thoughts on releases. Yes? In that situation, though, why would the photographer need a release if they're not selling? Um, and I get into this a little bit later. Uh, but no, no, but I'll, I'll touch on it now. Uh, if you're taking pictures in your home, in your studio, someplace that's private rather than public, there's a right of privacy that attaches to the pictures. And that's why I would want to have a release signed for anything that was done in a private setting. Is a short answer. Okay, which segues nice into who is protected by model release. We'll get into this more in depth. Generally, it's the photographer and any later publisher. Model release provides no protection to models. I can't think of anything it provides them at all, actually. <laughs> I don't know why they sign them. Uh, we'll get into more uh, the, the big forms and little forms later on. Um, it, it, there may be times when somebody won't sign one release, but you can sign a different one. That, allows you less use of their pictures. Um, what right, rights are granted to photographer and publisher in the model release? Basically, model release is a contract, and whatever rights are granted in there are whatever is bargained for and placed in the contract. So we, we've all seen boilerplate releases. Just know that those releases can be modified. Some models want to put in different terms, and it's fine. But just because it's boilerplate doesn't mean you can change it a little bit. And so that's for the photographer and the model. What can I do if I have a picture that I have no model release for? I'm sure we all have several of those laying around. Um, the short answer is it depends. We'll get into what it depends on in a second. Since I was talking about model releases, I decided to find out what were available for iPhones. And I found one yesterday. This one's called Easy. Uh, it's called Easy Release. I think it's $9.99. What this one lets you do is take a picture of your model. You put in your information. They put in their information. They they sign it. It's got a place for a witness. I don't think a witness is necessary. I've got lots of models where it was just me and the model. There was no witness, but it's got a place for a witness. And then the release, and I've read through that one, and that one is very heavily weighted in favor of the photographer, unless the photographer do anything with the pictures or the likeness, and they can be used for advertising or anything else the photographer wants. Again, some models might not want to sign such a full release. Okay, so the release prevents you from being successfully sued uh, in the future for unauthorized publication or for uh, invasion of privacy essentially by the model. Um, is it necessary? Well, here's the depends part. If it's going to be for commercial use, meaning some the, the image is going to be used to promote somebody's product or service, then yes. If it's in an editorial nature, then you don't need a release. And these are for pictures that were taken out in public. These are not ones that were done in private. 
So for example, you're at Piedmont Park, you taking some pictures and, and there's some people in your pictures. And you just want to use these pictures just to make a nice pretty wall hanger for yourself. Do you need a model release? No. Um, you want to sell these pictures to the, uh, uh, whatever the paper, uh, AJC, I guess. Uh, sell the pictures. Do you need a model release? Even if you can tell who these people are? The answer is no. You don't need a model release. Uh, if you want to sell this to somebody who's going to then um, use it in some commercial way, advocating a product, for example, or a point of view, then yes, you need a model release. Yes, sir. Question. So, with William on your website as a product for showing your abilities, and your person's role, is that, is from, it, is that cool? From what I've read, that's okay. That would be editorial use. Okay. Yes. What about selling it as art? Uh, again, from what I've read, that's called editorial use. Um, so, yeah, you, you can sell it as art all you want. Fine art, that's fine. I guess somebody could, someone is always going to be able to make some counter argument, and Trent probably knows what the counter argument is. No, actually, yeah. uh, well, so. Okay. What's your question? Uh, is there any benefits to having a hard copy over a digital copy? In today's world, I don't think so. Uh, you, if you have a digital copy, you can always print a hard copy. So I, I wouldn't see any difference. We're so used, accustomed to scans these days. I guess someone could try to make the argument that you've somehow altered the release or faked their signature or something. What I'm imagine having the digital format is that you don't lose the hard copy. That's, you, you easily lose hard copies. Digital is still to a you know internet storage, so they're right. up there. And you lose your twelve or something, they're still up there. That's a good point. Digital copies can go all over the place. And that particular program I had will email the copy out to you and to the model. So everybody's got a copy. Yes, and, and I tried it, I did it on my phone, and I found it, I mean, the little signature space was about, a, about that wide. I think on an iPad with maybe a stylus, it would be, be a slicker presentation. Yeah. Galaxy Note 3 with a pen. There you go. No, okay. <laughs> I mean, technically, as far as a signature goes, anytime you remember the old make, Mark and X, because you, you, you can't write, as long as you're putting your mark on there, then that is your signature. Um, when I sign credit card receipts, I just go bleh, because I don't want anybody to have my actual signature in case they want to forward something later on. Of course, I guess with the number of letters we've sent out over the years, that's probably a moot point. <laughs> um, so back, private sale, um, private sale is editorial use, so yes, you can do that without a model release, unless it was something taken inside with an expectation of privacy. Now, in terms of public versus private, um, obviously if you're outdoors, say at a shopping mall, that would probably be considered public? The, from what I've read on shop, shopping malls are technically private because they're, but they, they are open to the public, so they're often considered public. And but if you're trying to shoot pictures there, then you may get a mall and, cop saying no. How about like a, uh, say, a club venue where it's rented for a private party or like a wedding or something like that? Is that public, private, or some weird in between? I did not research that one. That sounds like a weird in between that you could argue. Either way, I don't think it's, it's not a public type where there's an expectation of privacy, though, because there, there are other people with cameras around. There, these things are going all over the place. So it'd be hard for someone to argue, you know, I, you, how dare you put a picture of me in there? Nobody would know I was there. Like, well, there are cameras all over the place. You had no expectation of privacy. You've never seen, I've never seen a thing while the guests have the sun on the Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm thinking of, of, of either, you know, weddings or concerts, mm -hmm. or a variety of things that can be put on this. As group activities yeah. that a group has put it on, and they control that venue for that period. Of um, question goes to: um, Would model releases be required if you've got a, a venue where it's a private venue, but a lot of people are coming in? I actually went to a, a venue at the um, Paris on Ponts in the Moulin Rouge. There was one of the what was that show? The, the Livy Ray, the Double Ds. The, the girls that do bras, I went to an event there that, where they were filming for the season finale, never saw it, and I had to sign a release for that. Okay. In public, do you need a release to shoot pictures if you can see the subject? The answer is generally no. Um, you don't need any, nobody gives you permission to be able to take pictures of what you can see standing in public. Exceptions being 
military installations. I've read about some bridges in New York and not allowed to photograph. But somebody's going to let you know if you can't take a picture of it. Um, no release is needed to sell pictures taken in public for editorial use. People make a living doing that. That's the paparazzi. I doubt that anybody, I doubt Bruce Jenner has given a model release to all the paparazzi running around trying to catch him wearing lipstick these days. But they are running around taking his picture and they're selling it to the tabloids, making a good living. So you definitely don't need a model release for that. Um, my research also said you don't need to publish in your portfolio. Uh, but again, talking about privacy can supersede that general rule. Now, long release, short release form, and portfolio only releases. Some people get scared with this long release that says you can do anything under the sun with it. And if I were going to, if I had the opportunity to shoot with Cindy Crawford, I don't think she'd give me a full commercial release because she's quite well handling her own commercial image and is making lots of money at it. So she might sign a release for me that would let me use the pictures I took in my portfolio and I could display them as pictures I took, but I couldn't then lease them or sell them to somebody else or sell them for commercial use. Online, there were I'll find it later. No, there it is. I found some pictures, or not pictures, some releases online that were good at being, had some long ones and some short ones. Uh, these are from the American Society of Media Photographers. I think there was a question on, on the meetup panel about, well, some people won't sign a long release. Is there a little short form I could use? And um, this little, little, is a little short form that ASMP. I'm not saying that right, <laughs> SMP suggests. You could take that, print on a little 3x5 card, keep it in your bag, and if you're at Piedmont Park and you take the perfect picture and there are people in it and you think, this is such a great photo. Someday, you know, the Atlanta Tourist Bureau might want to use this picture to promote the city. Then you could go over and say, hey guys, I took this great picture, here it is, I'll send you a copy. Would you mind signing this itty bit to little release? You may have more luck than pulling out one that's you know, signed down here. So they're also, port so that's the long release, the short form, portfolio only, and if minors are involved, definitely need to have the parent or parent sign. I guess to be perfectly safe, you'd have both parents sign, but I think if you've got one parent there, I think you're probably okay as long as they have custody of the child and didn't abduct the child. Can you go about, uh, non -fetal in the of property or I read up on property releases some. And what I've read, first of all, it said, generally property lease doesn't mean a release for taking pictures of somebody's property. It's more of an intellectual property type release. Um, from what I've read, if you can, if you can, you see somebody's private house from, you're standing on the street and you're looking up taking a picture of my house. I can't stop you from doing that and you don't need a release to do it. And there's a sidewalk. Yeah, as long as you're on public property. Um, now, you, you can't get on public property with, uh, uh, you know, 800 millimeter lens and then somehow take a picture that you wouldn't be able to take normally and, and normally is not well defined here. Uh, I read something about you can't get up on a rooftop and you know, use the long lens and take a picture inside of somebody's, you know, somebody's house and you can say, well, I was out in the public. I can take the picture. Well, you use special means and so that's a no-no. That's an invasion of privacy. Okay, so what rights do we have as photographers? Um, sorry. Well, I just got a, I was working with Alan May, which is a stack agency and trying to understand property, so I got really into it. And I understand that is if you, you know, have a private property and you take a picture of something that identifies that property, and you try and use it commercially, but then it identifies the property, a private uh, property is private, then you can't, you have, that's the, in the instance where you have to have properties. For instance, I shot pictures at my office, but there was nothing to identify Global Care or the, the owner of that building. It was just a general office. You couldn't tell anything. Okay. So then, then I don't think I need one. But if, if from based on what Alan right. is saying. So you're saying, just so I understand, and it's probably right. If you're taking pictures of the Coca Cola building where it says Coca Cola up there and then you're selling it to Pepsi uh, for commercial use, where they go like this, uh, that's probably bad. So you need, yes. you're not going to get a release from Coca Cola for that. <laughs> uh, Read a lot, a lot about whether you can take pictures of the police. Everything I've read says yes, you, you can, as long as you're in a public space and you're not interfering with the police doing their job. That touches on one question I want to ask. I've been hearing a lot about cops being very aggressive lately with photographers mm -hmm. in public places. Is there a way, you know, you let's say you know you're right, and but yet they're 
Yeah. They're yeah. taking you wrong. Question, you know, yeah. What's, Qu what's question is, how do you handle the police being aggressive where they're, you know that you're allowed to take pictures and they come over and they tell you they know you're not? Um, I think that's a point where discretion is the better point of valor. At some point, it's better to cut and run. Um, police do not have the power to make you erase your memory card. They don't have the power to make you forfeit your memory card. The erasing it is taking the property that you've created, that you've created this picture. Uh, they're not allowed to make you get rid of it. Uh, they certainly can't make you give the card to them. That's just plain theft. So you can know that, and it may be, depending on the situation, you may be better off just erasing the memory card there and having really good photo recovery software at home. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there is a happy ending to some of those things. Finding where to take that is difficult. Um, proving the value of your loss. You know what? You got a picture of a cop attacking somebody. You got to prove that that was valuable. And you would have made money on it. What your loss damages on it? Um, it's not a case I would take. But then again, I don't do municipal type of law. It, you probably would. Um, private property owners do have the right to restrict you and where you can photograph. If you're at somebody's private property and they say no cameras allowed, well, okay, no cameras allowed. Now suppose you're on somebody's private property, you've been taking some pictures, and they say no cameras, stop. Can they make you give the card or erase the card? The answer is no. Um, they can tell you to leave if you want to keep, keep, keep taking pictures. Um, and if you keep taking pictures, then they can have you arrested for trespass at that point because they've told you to stop doing something that you're doing. Or you can put the camera down and stop taking pictures. But they can't make you erase. Yes. I'm a little confused about that. There is a bar. I would like to go and take picture from outside, not inside. Mm -hmm. Do I need a release? From a, a barn? Can you see it from public property? I don't think you need a release. No. What are your intentions for the use of the picture after you take the picture? I think that would still fall under editorial use. Is it a really nice barn? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay. And for those of you on the, the streaming, if you couldn't hear all of that, the takeaway is um, best not take pictures of um, people who are striking, especially at Lockheed, because they have lots of lawyers. But any 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 labor law, I was being facetious there. not currently striking. Uh, and this is all common sense, but there's law behind it too. Um, no touching without consent. A, 
and unconsented to touching under Georgia law is a battery. You don't have to strike somebody, you can just touch them. That's a battery if they didn't consent to it. So technically, if you are working with somebody and you reach over and move their hair, you've committed a battery. So, yeah. And they can sue you for battery, and you can actually be, uh, the cops can come after you too because it's a crime and there's a civil component as well. Now, they'd have to prove what kind of damages they have, and that would be more difficult. But bottom line is you don't have any rights to touch the model. And if there's something you need to do to touch the model, ask first, or better yet, keep your makeup assistant there who can then do whatever needs to get done. Um, this particular model is a local dominatrix, and if you touched her without her consent, she can take care of you all by herself. <laughs> uh, uh, models have the right to sign any contract without being placed under duress. Duress is a fancy legal word for stress, as in he put a gun to my head and made me sign this release, and it was after the fact, I didn't want to do it, and I'd done all the stuff I didn't want to do, but I was under duress, so I signed it. So we don't pressure the models to, to sign releases. Models have the right to negotiate the contract terms. Now, we talked about earlier how a model release is just a contract. Some, some models want to say, um, you can post this on Tumblr but not Facebook or you know, whatever it may be. A lot of social media restrictions some people want. So that's fine to write into contracts and I would say it's important to let the model do that. Otherwise, the, the contract could be considered, this is kind of a stretch, but it could be considered a contract of adhesion where they were made to sign it and it could be potentially be invalidated. That's a stretch, but it could happen. Um, if you've got somebody who doesn't want to sign a model release, just don't work with them. Uh, finally, if, if you, this is not finally the end, but for this, if you're getting a weird vibe during a shoot, and this goes for model photographers, just stop. Um, anybody here remember hearing about a, a model from Atlanta who was out in California on a yacht of a Google exec who died from a heroin overdose, and then she just walked on off? Thought, wow, good thing I haven't run anybody like that. And then, the, the, um, then it, it turns out that uh, they started talking more about this girl, and they talked about how her boyfriend owned a nightclub here back when she was in Atlanta. I thought, I worked with a girl who went on and on and on about her boyfriend owned the masquerade. So I looked at some of her booking pictures, and I'm looking at tattoos, and I went back to pictures I had of her. Yeah, I shot with her. <laughs> and the shoot w went really bad. I had a really weird feeling. I stopped shooting with her, and she wound up getting kicked out of the shoot later on because she had a terrible attitude. Um, that's the only story I've had where something went bad and I just acted on it. I don't want to be with this person. But that's what I mean. If it's not right, it's not right. Personal privacy model releases. So you take a picture, you own the copyright because you press the shutter. Okay. That doesn't mean you have the right to publish a picture that was taken in private. It gets back to why we have all the model releases. Privacy laws supersede editorial rights. So you've got a picture you took. Privacy your home. It's your picture and you want to put it up for editorial use, but it's an 18-year-old who's you know, topless or whatever, and you want to put it on your site, unless you have a release, I would say don't do it. Um, if you're shooting with somebody, and say the, these last two are kind of combined, say you're shooting somebody who's a friend, um, and you don't have a model release, and you're just, you're getting some good content, and later on down the road, and you, you both know that it's just for fun, but you, you can post it, later on you two are no longer friends, um, husband, wife, break up, whatever. If you don't have a model release that releases you for that shoot on that day, you need to pull that picture down because you could get in trouble because the person could then say, that was just between us. That was for our memories and that was never to be published. And you could say, well, yeah, we talked about it and you said I could publish it. Well, if the person later on says, no, that's not what we agreed to, there is no meeting of the minds and contracts require a meeting of the minds. So that's why it's best to have them in writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's okay. I mean, it's, it's not the best practice, but you've got some proof that this person emailed you back. They can always say, that wasn't me emailing, that was somebody else who got into my account or whatever. Um, but I, I think that's certainly better than nothing. And I'm guilty of having done this. I've got pictures up as I was working on this going, oh, crap, I should pull this down and this down and this down. Um, it's probably okay, but we're supposed to talk about best practices. Um, okay, in public, say somebody, the example from the book I was reading, somebody's huddled over a bench injecting AIDS medication or, or using hernia cream, you know, whatever. Something that's more of a private nature. They're out in public, but they're making an effort to not be seen. Are you okay to then take their picture and publish that to the world? Because they're out in public, right? Well, 
they were trying to be private, and you're showing something that would be offensive to a reasonable person, that AIDS medication and hemorrhoid cream, it's offensive to them to have that known, so you're probably not okay in publishing that kind of a picture. Um, false light, you take a picture of a guy, and he's walking, he's walking out of the store, and he slips on a banana peel, and you didn't stage it, you didn't put it there, he just slipped. Well, okay, people slip. But then if the publisher then puts underneath it, and then here's his likeness, that's likely to be, not the picture wasn't the problem, but it was the text that was placed with the picture, not in danger, but the person who then published the one with the defamatory language, that person probably got a problem. So don't do that. Okay. We're doing some stuff on copyright, then we're done. Uh, copyright. So I made a copy. It's mine, right? <laughs> uh, this particular picture, the model came to me with a similar picture and said, let's do something like this. I said, okay, down for that. But this is not an actual copy of the other picture because I used the clone brush way too much and brushed in all the uh, candy canes since I didn't have enough white material on the floor. And so this is not a copy of the other picture. So I have no doubt that I own the copyright to this one. Copyright requires some minimal level of originality. There's some cases where people will try to take a picture of the picture and then say, well, I'm the one who clicked the shutter. It's my copyright. It's not. Um, we talked about this earlier. The person pressing the shutter under the Copyright Design and Patent Act of 1988 is the person who owns the copyright most of the time. Now, if somebody's hiring you for pictures, then they probably have the copyright. There was a question in the meetup group about can there be such thing as joint ownership of copyright? Sure there can. So you've got a book that's got three authors. All three of them have copyright interest in that book. Remember the Ellen DeGeneres Bradley Cooper picture where there was some award show and he's got the long arms taking the picture? Well, a lot of scholars think that Bradley Cooper owns the copyright to that one. I think Samsung wanted that one for their, their use. He'd have to let them know they can use it. Or does Ellen DeGeneres have part of the copyright because she set the whole thing up. She orchestrated it and then she sort of hired Bradley Cooper, who had longer arms than she did, to just press the button. Well, this is back to the, can they sue you for copyright infringement? And it depends. Um, not always a bright line test. Um, what do you have if you have the copyright? That means you can, you own the, the photo, you can reproduce it, distribute it, display it, and sell it. What's your opinion of the recent example where the monkey put the shutter on the camera? You know this I, I don't know that one. I do know the uh, Michael Jordan one. That, uh, the monkey hit the shutter on the camera. The photographer who set up the camera was told legally that he did not have a copyright. Even though he did all the stuff, the monkey took the picture. Yeah, and obviously it was a monkey for hire. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so if you have the addition of a demand, so he was told that. He did not own the copyright. I, so he did I, not. I, I think, well, the monkey certainly can't own the copyright. Somebody has to have the copyright. That's, uh, I think we'll transfer to the camera. If I was a judge, that's how I would decide. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting question. Um, and I don't know. So having an idea does not bestow the copyright. So I had this great idea for an opium den shoot. And it was going to be, <laughs> it's going to be, it was going to be black and red and beautiful model and some great lingerie. I was going to light the back and the hair and all that. So beautiful idea and beautifully executed by Trent. So even if I'd had the idea, which I did not, it's the person who makes the tangible expression of the idea happen, that's the one who gets the copyright. Um, what is fair use of copyright work? This, I just ran into this. Basically, if there's a picture and you want to use it for something, if you can figure out somehow to argue that it's for educational reporting and news reporting and general public interest, you may be able to use it under the fair use argument. Um, courts will decide whether that's fair use or not, or you'll wind up paying somebody. Yes, sir? Okay, so if someone finds a great picture of mine online, and they decide they want to use it for wallpaper on their computer, and it's copyrighted, and they just make a copy of it, and they just use it for personal use on their computer, is that okay? Not being an IP, an intellectual property guy, I don't know the exact answer. They're not <laughs> benefiting from it. They're not holding it out. They're not selling it. They're not they? selling they're it. Just enjoying it. I, personally, I think I think they're okay doing it, but if you were selling it, and you were required to to buy from you for that use, then you can take a step by step. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what if you have? What do you do if you have copyright infringement? You've got a couple options. You can do nothing. 
Some people do that. You can request that the person who has the picture up take it down. You can send um, a takedown notice to their ISP under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and tell the ISP to pull it down and let them know that you have the copyright. Or you can send a cease and desist letter to the person who has the picture up, ask them to pull it down, or you could ask them to pay you for the use. Or you could find a lawyer and sue them. Um, all of that sounds like a lot of work. And I think that this is a matter of, if it's a great picture and you're making money on it and somebody's really screwing with your livelihood, it's probably worth going through that. If it's a website where somebody's using your picture and it's a really good picture, I think I'd probably just ask them for photo credit. Get, get the credit rather than trying to be a, try to enforce the rights of what else you could do. Um, you can register pictures for copyright at that website, copyright.gov slash EVO, $140 filing fee. And it looks on there that they were only accepting pictures for advertising or marketing. I've never registered a picture for copyright, so I'm just telling you what I've read. Is, is that for a single picture or a submission of the I, I have no idea. Okay. You still own the copyright. It just makes it easier. Yeah, yeah, right. I think, I think that if you register it, it, it opens up a triple damages option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only okay. thing that does is it just makes it easier to protect your, yeah. if someone does it for it. That's all it yeah. does for you. You own the copyright regardless of whether you file or not. Yeah. Um, okay, the final, or next to final slide here. Uh, so there was, uh, Trent, I think it was you who brought up the, so the guy who took the original Michael Jordan picture, the picture on the left, and he was, some magazine asked him to take some pictures. We so took the picture. And then, so the silhouette on the left is a silhouette of his picture. The silhouette on the right is the Nike Jumpman that's being used. He never sold the rights to use his picture or a derivative of that to Nike. And he's now suing them. So the, I was doing some research, it says the transformation, modification, or adaptation of the original work must be substantial and bear its author's personality to be original and thus protected by copyright. Now, in this picture on the left, that's not how Michael Jordan usually plays. He's right-handed, carries the ball with his right hand, not left. And when he's dunking, that's not how he generally dunks. The photographer that was taking pictures had him put the ball in his left hand and had him do this jump, which is called frangite in ballet terms, which means just a big jump with a split up in the air. So the, the photographer's argument is, I created that image and that silhouette, and it's mine. You can't use it. And the only thing that Nike seemed to have done is rather than having the uh, right hand be up, they put it down to make it look more attractive. Um, I don't remember if it took a whole other picture. Uh, they modified it to put skyline in the background and silhouetted it. So there's a big question about whether the person who took the original picture on the left has any plan of what he's done on the right. But also when it's silhouetted, who's to say his right hand is Who's to say that's Michael Jordan? You know, that could be anything. I mean, yeah. I just there for food for thought. I don't have the answer. Another example is uh, an Associated Press photographer had a picture of President Obama and Shepard Ferry made posters out of that. And he lost. He just said, why not? This is an original work. This picture is my inspiration, but when you laid it over, really? Exact. Interesting. Um, I'm about done. Um, the, I've got one more slide to show you, then we'll take any questions. Uh, the last slide is if I've scared is for this purpose. If I've scared you off about you know all these releases and I can get sued for this and model can come after me for that, and you just want to take pretty pictures. There are things other than pictures. Although Trent took a, a great picture of two models in a shower recently. You may have seen it. Girls with whipped cream is Gina and Victoria, and somebody on. Um, Somebody objected to the picture, um, and so there are other things to take pictures of as well, and naked ducks never require model release. <laughs> as long as they're a public property. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'll probably get the Lennox Park Association after me soon after this. Yes? In terms of model releases for long-term projects, uh, best practice is to do one every day. Yeah. I'm not saying anybody does it, but. Any other questions? Yes, sir.
Okay, so I'm shooting away a higher attention photographer because they want a second shooter. And the second shooter, I uh, tell them to go take pictures in the reception hall, do the group shots. He trips and falls into the way, taking messages out. How screwed am I, or what can I tell to make myself less? less I think you might want to hire them as an independent contractor, not as an employee, because independent con there's less nexus to you from that. Uh, the law on master servant is the master is generally responsible for the torts of the servant. So if you can make them not be your servant by being an independent contractor, um, they're still going to be awful mad, though. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Give us the website for that short one, the short relationship. Um, I'm not searching. I should not find anything like that. Yeah, it's, um, I'll just, it's ASMP.org. Okay. Okay. Guys, make sure to go ahead and just, uh, yeah, general questions for tonight yeah. that you like for a link or so on. Feel free to message it as a comment on meetup.com and we'll reply with the appropriate links. Uh, as soon as we can, just so there's a record for anyone who may need okay. for any general information that sure. should be out there. Anyways. And I have a stack of business cards up here. I'd ask everybody to take two, one for themselves, and one if they ever find somebody who needs a lawyer. Thank you all very much. <laughs>